Chapter thirty six of the Trumpet Major. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy. Chapter thirty six. Derriman sees chances. Meanwhile, Sailor Cornick had gone on his way as far as the Forking Roads, where he met Festus Derriman on foot. The latter, attracted by the seaman's dress, and by seeing him come from the mill, at once accosted him. Jim, with the greatest readiness, fell into conversation, and told the same story as that he had related at the mill. "'Bob Loveday going to be married?' repeated Festus. "'You all seem struck a heap with that.' "'No, no, I, I never heard news that pleased me more.' While Cornick was gone, Festus, instead of passing straight on, halted on the little bridge, and meditated. Bob, being now interested elsewhere, would probably not resent the siege of Anne's heart by another. There could, at any rate, be no further possibility of that looming duel which had troubled the yeoman's mind ever since his horse-play on Anne at the house on the down. To march into the mill and propose to Mrs. Loveday for Anne, before John's interest could revive in her, was, to this hero's thinking, excellent discretion. The day had already begun to darken when he entered, and the cheerful fire shone red upon the floor and walls. Mrs. Loveday received him alone, and asked him to take a seat by the chimney-corner, a little of the old hankering for him as a son-in-law having permanently remained with her. Uh, "'Your servant, Mrs. Loveday,' he said, "'and I will tell you at once what I came for. You will say that I take time by the forelock when I inform you that it is to push on my long-wished-for alliance with your daughter.' as I believe she is now a free woman again. "'Thank you, Mr. Derriman,' said the mother placably. "'But she is ill at present. I'll mention it to her when she is better. Uh, ask her to alter her cruel, cruel resolves against me on the score of, of my consuming passion for her. In short,' continued Festus, dropping his parlour language in his warmth, "'I'll tell thee what, Dame Loveday, I want the maid, and must have her.' Mrs. Loveday replied that this was very plain speaking. "'Well, well it is. But Bob has given her up. He never meant to marry her. I'll tell you, Mrs. Loveday, what I have never told a soul before. I was standing upon Babbeth Quay on that very day in last September that Bob set sail, and I heard him say to his brother John that he gave your daughter up.' "'Then it was very unmanly of him to trifle with her soul,' said Mrs. Loveday warmly. "'Who did he give her up to?' Festus replied with hesitation, "'He gave her up to John.' "'To John? How could he give her up to a man already over head and ears in love with that actress woman?' Uh, "'Oh? Uh, you, you surprise me. Which actress is it?' Oh, "'That Miss Johnson. Anne tells me that he loves her hopelessly.' Festus arose. Miss Johnson seemed suddenly to acquire high value as a sweetheart at this announcement. He had himself felt a nameless attractiveness in her, and John had done likewise. John crossed his path in all possible ways. Before the yeoman had replied, somebody opened the door, and the firelight shone upon the uniform of the person they discussed. Festus nodded on recognising him, wished Mrs. Loveday good evening, and went out precipitately. "'So Bob told you he meant to break off with my arm when he went away?' Mrs. Loveday remarked to the trumpet-major. "'I wish I had known of it before.' John appeared disturbed at the sudden charge. He murmured that he could not deny it, and then hastily turned from her and followed Derriman, whom he saw before him on the bridge. Uh, Derriman he shouted. Festus started and looked round. "'Well, trumpet-major,' he said blandly, "'when will you have sense enough to mind your own business and not come here telling things you have heard of by sneaking behind people's backs?' demanded John hotly. "'If you can't learn in any other way, I shall have to pull your ears again, as I did the other day.' "'You who pull my ears? How can you tell that lie when you know twas somebody else pulled them? "'Oh, no, no, I pulled your ears and thrashed you in a mild way.' "'You'll swear to it. Surely it was another man.' "'It was in the power of the public house. You were almost in the dark.' and John added a few details to the particular blows which amounted to proof itself. Th th "'Then I heartily ask your pardon for saying 'twas a lie,' 
cried Festus, advancing with extended hand and a genial smile. "'Sure, if I had known twas you, I wouldn't have insulted you by denying it.' "'That was why you didn't challenge me, then.' "'That was it. I wouldn't for the world have hurt your nice sense of honour by letting you go unchallenged if I had known. And now, you see, unfortunately, I can't bend the mistake. So long a time has passed since it happened that the heat of my temper is gone off. I, I couldn't oblige ye, try how I might, uh, for I am not a man, Trumpet Major, that can butcher in cold blood. No, not I, uh, nor you neither, from what I know of ye. So, uh, willy-nilly, uh, we must fain let it pass, eh? Mm, we must, I suppose, said John, smiling grimly. Who did you think I was, then, that night when I boxed you all round? No, 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 no don't press me, replied the yeoman. I can't reveal it would be disgracing, Master, to show how very wide of the truth the mockery of wine was able to leave my senses. Uh, we will let it be buried in eternal mixens of forgetfulness. As you wish, said the trumpet major, loftily. But if you ever should think you knew it was me, why, you know where to find me. And Loveday walked off. The instant that he was gone, Festus shook his fist at the evening star, which happened to lie in the same direction as that taken by the dragoon. "'Now for my revenge! Duels! Lifelong disgrace to me, if ever I fight with a man of blood below my own! There are other remedies for upper-class souls. Matilda! That's my way!' Festus strode along till he reached the hall, where Cripplestraw appeared gazing at him from under the arch of the porter's lodge. Derriman dashed open the entrance hurdle with such violence that the whole row of them fell flat in the mud. "'Mercy, Master Festers,' said Cripplestraw. "'Surely,' I says to myself when I see ye a-coming, "'surely Master Festers is fuming like that, because there's no chance of the enemy coming this year after all.' Uh, Cri "'Cripplestraw, I've been wounded to the heart,' replied Derriman, with a lurid brow. "'And the man yet lives, and you want your auspices instantly.' "'Certainly, Master. Uh, no, no, Cripplestraw, not my pistols, but, but, but my new-cut clothes, my, my heavy gold seals, my, my silver-copped cane, and my buckles that cost more money than he ever saw. Yes, I must tell somebody, and I'll tell you, because there's no other fool near. He loves her, heart and soul. He's poor, she's tip-top genteel, and not rich. I am rich, by comparison. I'll court the pretty play-actress and win her before his eyes.' play actress, Maister Derriman? Yes, I saw her this very day, met her by accident, and spoke to her. She's still at the town, perhaps because of him. I can meet her at any hour of the day. But I don't mean to marry her, not I. I will court her for my pastime, and to annoy him. It will be all the more death to him that I don't want her. Then perhaps he will say to me, You have taken my one ewe lamb, meaning that I am the king, and he's the poor man, as in the church verse. And he'll beg for mercy when tis too late, unless, meanwhile, I shall have tired of my new toy. Saddle the horse, Cripple Straw, to-morrow at ten. Full of this resolve to scourge John Loveday to the quick through his passion for Miss Johnson, Festus came out booted and spurred at the time appointed, and set off on his morning ride. Miss Johnson's theatrical engagement having long ago terminated, she would have left the royal watering-place with the rest of the visitors, had not matrimonial hopes detained her there. These had nothing whatever to do with John Loveday, as may be imagined, but with a stout, staid boat-builder in Cove Row by the quay, who had shown much interest in her impersonations. Unfortunately, this substantial man had not been quite so attentive since the end of the season as his previous manner led her to expect, and it was a great pleasure to the lady to see Mr. Derriman leaning over the harbour bridge with his eyes fixed upon her as she came towards it after a stroll past her elderly wooer's house. "'Odd take it, ma'am, you didn't tell me when I saw you last that the tooting man with the blue jacket and lace was yours devoted,' began Festus. "'Who do you mean?' In Matilda's ever-changing emotional interests, John Loveday was a stale and unprofitable for personality. "'Why, why that trumpet major man!' "'Oh, what of him?' "'Come, he loves you, and, and you know it, ma'am.' She knew at any rate how to take the current when it served. 
so she glanced at Festus, folded her lips meaningly, and nodded. "'I've come to cut him out!' She shook her head, being unsafe to speak until she knew a little more of the subject. "'What?' said Festus, reddening. "'Do you mean to say that you think of him seriously? You, who might look so much higher?' "'Constant dropping will wear away a stone, and you should only hear his pleading. His handsome face is impressive, and his manners are, oh, so genteel. I am not rich. I am, in short, a poor lady of decayed family, who has nothing to boast of but my blood and ancestors, and they won't find a body in foot and clothing. I hold the world but as the world, Derimanio, a stage where every man must play a part, and mine a sad one. She dropped her eyes thoughtfully, and sighed. "'We will talk of this,' said Festus, much affected. "'Let us walk to the lookout.' She made no objection, and said as they turned that way, "'Mr. Derriman, a long time ago I found something belonging to you, but I have never yet remembered to return it.' And she drew from her bosom the paper which Anne had dropped in the meadow when eluding the grasp of Festus on that summer day. "'Zounds! I smell fresh meat!' cried Festus, when he looked it over. "'Tis in my uncle's writing, and tis what I heard him singing on the day the French didn't come, and afterwards saw him marking in the road. "'Tis something he's got hid away. "'Give me the paper there. There's a dear. It, "'Tis worth sterling gold.' Uh, "'Halves, then?' said Matilda tenderly. Oh, "'Gad, yes, anything!' replied Festus, blazing into a smile, for she had looked up in her best new manner at the possibility that he might be worth the winning. They went up the steps to the summit of the cliff, and dwindled over it against the sky. End of chapter 36 Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 37 of A Trumpet Major. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy. Chapter 37 Reaction. There was no letter from Bob, though December had passed and the new year was two weeks old. His movements were, however, pretty accurately registered in the papers, which John still brought, but which Anne no longer read. During the second week in December the victory sailed for Sheerness, and on the ninth of the following January the public funeral of Lord Nelson took place in St Paul's. Then there came a meagre line addressed to the family in general. Bob's new Portsmouth attachment was not mentioned, but he told them he had been one of the eight-and-forty seamen who walked two and two in the funeral procession, and that Captain Hardy had borne the banner of emblems on the same occasion. The crew was soon to be paid off at Chatham, when he thought of returning to Portsmouth for a few days to see a valued friend. After that, he should come home. But the spring advanced without bringing him, and John watched Anne Garland's desolation with augmenting desire to do something towards consoling her. The old feelings, so religiously held in check, were stimulated to rebelliousness, though they did not show themselves in any direct manner as yet. The miller, in the meantime, who seldom interfered in such matters, was observed to look meaningly at Anne and the trumpet-major from day to day, and by and by he spoke privately to John. His words were short and to the point. Anne was very melancholy. She had thought too much of Bob. Now it was plain that they had lost him for many years to come. Well, he had always felt that of the two he would rather John married her. Now John might settle down there and succeed where Bob had failed. So if you could get her, my sonny, to think less of him and more of thyself, it would be a good thing for all. An inward excitement had risen in John, but he suppressed it and said firmly, Fairness to Bob before everything. He had forgotten her, and there's an end on it. She's not forgot him. Well, well, think it over. This discourse was the cause of his penning a letter to his brother. He begged for a distinct statement whether, 
as John at first supposed, Bob's verbal renunciation of Anne on the quay, had been only a momentary ebullition of friendship, which he would be cruel to take literally, or whether, as seemed now, it had passed from a hasty resolve to a standing purpose, persevered in for his own pleasure, with not a care for the result on poor Anne. John waited anxiously for the answer, but no answer came, and the silence seemed even more significant than a letter of assurance could have been of his absolution from further support to a claim which Bob himself had so clearly renounced. Thus it happened that paternal pressure, brotherly indifference, and his own released impulse operated in one delightful direction, and the trumpet major once more approached Anne, as in the old time. But it was not till she had been left to herself for a full five months, and the bluebells and ragged robins of the following year were again making themselves common to the rambling eye, that he directly addressed her. She was tying up a group of tall flowering plants in the garden. She knew that he was behind her, but she did not turn. She had subsided into a placid dignity which enabled her, when watched, to perform any little action with seeming composure. Very different from the flutter of her inexperienced days. "'Are you never going to turn round?' he at length asked, good-humouredly. She then did turn, and looked at him for a moment without speaking, a certain suspicion looming in her eyes, as if suggested by his perceptible want of ease. "'How like summer it is getting to feel, is it not?' she said. John admitted that it was getting to feel like summer, and bending his gaze upon her with an earnestness which no longer left any doubt of his subject, went on to ask, "'Have you ever in these last weeks thought of how it used to be between us?' She replied quickly, "'Oh, John, you shouldn't begin that again. I am almost another woman now.' "'Well, that's all the more reason why I should, isn't it?' Anne looked thoughtfully at the other end of the garden, faintly shaking her head. "'I don't quite see it like that,' she returned. "'You feel yourself quite free, don't you?' "'Quite free,' she said instantly, and with proud distinctness. Her eyes fell, and she repeated more slowly, "'Quite free.' Then her thoughts seemed to fly from herself to him. "'But you are not?' "'I am not?' "'Miss Johnson!' "'Oh, that woman! You know as well as I that all make-up, and that I never for a moment thought of her.' I had an idea you were acting, but I wasn't sure. Well, that's nothing now. Anne, I want to relieve your life, to cheer you in some way, to make some amends for my brother's bad conduct. If you cannot love me, liking will be well enough. I have thought over every side of it so many times. For months have I been thinking it over, and I am at last sure that I do right to put it to you in this way. That I don't wrong Bob, I am quite convinced... As far as he is concerned, we be both free. Had I not been sure of that, I would never have spoken. Father wants me to take on the mill, and it will please him if you can give me one little hope. It will make the house go on altogether better, if you can think of me. You are generous and good, John, she said, as a big round tear, bold, helter-skelter down her face and hat-strings. I am not. I, I fear I am quite the opposite, he said without looking at her. It will be all gain to me, but you have not answered my question. She lifted her eyes. John, I cannot, she said with a cheerless smile. Positively, I cannot. Will you make me a promise? What is it? I want you to promise first. Yes, it is dreadfully unreasonable, she added in a mild distress, but do promise. John, by this time, seemed to have a feeling that it was all up with him for the present. "'I promise,' he said listlessly. "'It is that you won't speak to me about this for ever so long,' she returned, with emphatic kindliness. "'Very good,' he replied. "'Very good. "'Dear Anne, you don't think I have been unmanly or unfair in starting this anew?' Anne looked into his face without a smile. "'You have been perfectly natural,' she murmured. "'And so I think have I.' "'John, mournfully, "'you will not avoid me for this, or be afraid of me. "'I will not break my word. 
I will not worry you any more. Thank you, John. You need not have said worry. It isn't that. Well, I am very blind and stupid. I have been hurting your head all the time without knowing it. It is my fate, I suppose. Men who love women the very best always blunder and give more pain than those who love them less. Anne laid one of her hands on the other as she softly replied, looking down at them. No one loves me as well as you, John. Nobody in the world is so worthy to be loved, and yet I cannot anyhow love you rightly. And lifting her eyes, But I do so feel for you that I will try as hard as I can to think about you. Well, that is something, he said, smiling. You say I must not speak about it again for ever so long. How long? Now that's not fair, Anne retorted going down the garden and leaving him alone. About a week passed. Then one afternoon the miller walked up to Anne indoors, a weighty topic being expressed in his tread. I was so glad, Bianni, he began with a knowing smile, to see that from the mill-window last week. He flung a nod in the direction of the garden. Anne innocently inquired what it could be. Jack and you in the garden together, he continued, laying his hand gently on her shoulder and stroking it. It would so please me, my dear little girl, if, if you could get to light him better than that weathercock, Master Bob. Anne shook her head, not in forceful negation, but to imply a kind of neutrality. Can't you? Come now, said the miller. She threw back her head with a little laugh of grievance. How you will beset me, she expostulated. It makes me feel very wicked in not obeying you and being faithful to... faithful but she could not trust that side of the subject to words. "'Why would it please you so much?' she asked. "'John is as steady and staunch a feather as ever blowed a trumpet. I have always thought you might do better with him than with Bob. Now, I have a plan for taking him into the mill and letting him have a comfortable time of it after his long knocking about. But so much depends upon you that I must bide a bit till I see what your pleasure is about the poor fellow.' Mind, my dear, I don't want to force ye. I only just ask ye. Anne meditatively regarded the miller from under her shady eyelids, the fingers of one hand playing a silent tattoo on her bosom. I don't know what to say to you, she answered brusquely, and went away. But these discourses were not without their effect upon the extremely conscientious mind of Anne. They were, moreover, much helped by an incident which took place one evening in the autumn of this year, when John came to tea. Anne was sitting on a low stool in front of the fire, her hands clasped across her knee. John Loveday had just seated himself on a chair close behind her, and Mrs. Loveday was in the act of filling the teapot from the kettle which hung in the chimney exactly above Anne. The kettle slipped forward suddenly, whereupon John jumped from the chair and put his own two hands over Anne's just in time to shield them and the precious knee she clasped from the jet of scalding water which had directed itself upon that point. The accidental overflow was instantly checked by Mrs. Loveday, but what had come was received by the devoted trumpet major on the back of his hands. Anne, who had hardly been aware that he was behind her, started up like a person awakened from a trance. "'What have you done to yourself, poor John, to keep it off me?' she cried, looking at his hands. John reddened emotionally at her words. "'It's a bit of a scald, that's all,' he replied, drawing a finger across the back of one hand and bringing off the skin by the touch. "'You are scalded painfully, and I not at all.' She gazed into his kind face, as she had never gazed there before. And when Mrs. Loveday came back with oil and other liniments for the wound, Anne would let nobody dress it but herself. It seemed as if her coyness had all gone, and when she had done all that lay in her power, she still sat by him. At his departure she said what she had never said to him in her life before. "'Come again soon?' In short, that impulsive act of devotion, the last of a series of the same tenor, had been the added drop which finally turned the wheel. John's character deeply impressed her. His determined steadfastness to his lodestar won her admiration. 
the more especially as that star was herself. She began to wonder more and more how she could have so persistently held out against his advances before Bob came home to renew girlish memories, which by that time got considerably weakened. Could she not, after all, please the miller, and try to listen to John? By so doing she would make a worthy man happy, the only sacrifice being at worst that of her unworthy self, whose future was no longer valuable. As for Bob, the woman is to be pitied who loves him, she reflected indignantly, and persuaded herself that, whoever the woman might be, she was not Anne Garland. After this, there was something of recklessness and something of pleasantry in the young girl's manner of making herself an example of the triumph of pride and common sense over memory and sentiment. Her attitude had been epitomised in her defiant singing at the time she learnt that Bob was not leal and true. John, as was inevitable, came again almost immediately, drawn thither by the sun of her first smile on him, and the words which had accompanied it. And now, instead of going off to her little pursuits upstairs, downstairs, across the room in the corner, or to any place except where he happened to be, as had been her custom hitherto, she remained seated near him, returning interesting answers to his general remarks, and at every opportunity letting him know that at last he had found favour in her eyes. The day was fine, and they went out of doors, where Anne endeavoured to seat herself on the sloping stone of the window-sill. "'How good you have become lately,' said John, standing over her and smiling in the sunlight which blazed against the wall. "'I fancy you stayed at home this afternoon on my account.' "'Perhaps I have,' she said gaily. "'Do whatever we may for him, dame, we cannot do too much, for he's one that has guarded our land. "'And he has done more than that. He has saved me from a dreadful scalding. "'The back of your hand will not be well for a long time, John, will it?' "'He held out his hand to regard its condition, and the next natural thing was to take hers.' There was a glow upon his face when he did it. His star was at last on a fair way towards the zenith after its long and weary declination. The least penetrating eye could have perceived that Anne had resolved to let him woo, possibly, in her temerity, to let him win. Whatever silent sorrow might be locked up in her, it was by this time thrust a long way down from the light. "'I want you to go somewhere with me, if you will.' he said, still holding her hand. "'Yes, where is it?' He pointed to a distant hillside, which, hitherto green, had within the last few days begun to show scratches of white on its face. "'Up there,' he said. "'I see little figures of men moving about. What are they doing?' "'Cutting out a huge picture of the king on horseback and the earth of the hill. The king's head is to be as big as our mill-pond, and his body as big as his garden.' He and the horse will cover more than an acre. When shall we go? Whenever you please, said she. John, cried Mrs. Loveday from the front door, here's a friend come for you. John went round, and found his trusty lieutenant, Trumpeter Buck, waiting for him. A letter had come to the barracks for John in his absence, and the trumpeter, who was going for a walk, had brought it along with him. Buck then entered the mill to discuss, if possible, a mug of last year's mead with the miller, and John proceeded to read his letter. Anne be still round the corner where he had left her. When he had read a few words, he turned as pale as a sheet, but he did not move, and perused the writing to the end. Afterwards he laid his elbow against the wall, and put his palm to his head, thinking with painful intentness. Then he took himself vigorously in hand, as it were, and gradually became natural again. When he parted from Anne to go home with Buck, she noticed nothing different in him. In barracks that evening, he read the letter again. It was from Bob, and the agitating contents were these. Dear John, I have drifted off from writing till the present time, because I have not been clear about my feelings, but I have discovered them at last and can say beyond doubt that I mean to be faithful to my dearest Anne after all. The fact is, John, 
I've got into a bit of a scrape, and I've a secret to tell you about it, which must go no further on any account. On landing last autumn I fell in with a young woman, and we got rather warm, as folks do. In short, we liked one another well enough for a while. But I've got into shoal water with her, and have found her to be a terrible take-in. Nothing in her at all. No sense, no niceness, all tantrums and empty noise, John, though she seemed monstrous clever at first. So my heart comes back to its old anchorage. I hope my return to faithfulness will make no difference to you, but as you showed by your looks at our parting that you should not accept my offer to give her up, made in too much haste, as I have since found, I feel that you won't mind that I have returned to the path of honour. I did not write to Anne as yet, and please do not let her know a word about the other young woman, or there will be the devil to pay. I shall come home and make all things right, please God. In the meantime, I should take it as a kindness, John, if you would keep a brotherly eye upon Anne and guide her mind back to me. I shall die of sorrow if anybody sets her against me, for my hopes are getting bound up in her again quite strong. Hoping you are as jovial as times go, I am your affectionate brother, Robert. When the cold daylight fell upon John's face as he dressed himself next morning, the incipient yesterday's wrinkle in his forehead had become permanently graven there. He had resolved, for the sake of that only brother whom he had nursed as a baby, instructed as a child, and protected and loved always, to pause in his procedure for the present, and at least to do nothing to hinder Bob's restoration to favour, if a genuine, even though temporarily smothered, love for Anne should still hold possession of him. But, having arranged to take her to see the excavated figure of the king, he started for Overcombe during the day, as if nothing had occurred to check the smooth course of his love. End of chapter 37 Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 38 of The Trumpet Major This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy Chapter 38 A Delicate Situation "'I am ready to go,' said Anne, as soon as he arrived. He paused, as if taken aback by her readiness, and replied with much uncertainty, "'Would it—wouldn't it be better to put it off till there is less sun?' The very slightest symptom of surprise arose in her as she rejoined, "'But the weather may change, or had we better not go at all?' "'Oh, oh no, it was only a thought. We will start at once.' and along the vale they went, John keeping himself about a yard from her right hand. When the third field had been crossed, they came upon half a dozen little boys at play. "'Why don't he clasp her to his side like a man?' said the biggest and rudest boy. "'Why don't he clasp her to his side like a man?' echoed all the rude, smaller boys in a chorus. The trumpet-major turned, and after some running succeeded in smacking two of them with his switch, returning to Anne, breathless. I, "'I am ashamed they should have insulted you so,' he said, blushing for her. "'They said no harm, poor boys,' she replied reproachfully. Poor John was dumb with perception. The gentle hint upon which he would have eagerly spoken only one short day ago was now like fire to wound. They presently came to some stepping-stones across a brook. John crossed first without turning his head, and Anne, just lifting the skirt of her dress, crossed behind him. When they had reached the other side, a village girl and a young shepherd approached the brink to cross. Anne stopped and watched them. The shepherd took a hand of the young girl in each of his own, and walked backward over the stones, facing her, and keeping her upright by his grasp, both of them laughing as they went. "'What are you staying for, Miss Garland?' asked John. "'I was only thinking how happy they are,' she said quietly and withdrawing her eyes from the tender pair she turned and followed him, not knowing that the seeming sound of a passing bumblebee was a suppressed groan from John. When they reached the hill they found forty navvies at work removing the dark sod so as to lay bare the chalk beneath. 
the equestrian figure that their shovels were forming was scarcely intelligible to John and Anne, now they were close, and after pacing from the horse's head down his breast to his hoof, back by way of the king's bridle arm, past the bridge of his nose and into his cocked hat, Anne said that she'd had enough of it, and stepped out of the chalk clearing upon the grass. The trumpet major had remained all the time in a melancholy attitude within the rowel of His Majesty's right spur. "'My shoes are caked with chalk,' she said as they walked downwards again, and she drew back her dress to look at them. "'How can I get some of it cleared off?' "'If you was to wipe them in the long grass there,' said John, pointing to a spot where the blades were rank and dense, "'some of it would come off.' Having said this, he walked on with religious firmness. Anne raked her little feet on the right side, on the left side, over the toe and behind the heel. Measure's chalk held its own. Panting with her exertion, she gave it up, and at length overtook him. "'I hope it is right now,' he said, looking gingerly over his shoulder. "'No, indeed,' said she. "'I wanted some assistance, someone to steady me.' It's so hard to stand on one foot and wipe the out support. I was in danger of toppling over, and so gave it up. Merciful stars, what an opportunity, thought the poor fellow, while she waited for him to offer help. But his lips remained closed, and she went on with a pouting smile. You seem in such a hurry. Why are you in such a hurry? After all the fine things you've said about, about caring so much for me and all that, you won't stop for anything. It was too much for John. "'Upon my heart and life, my dear—' he began. Here Bob's letter crackled warningly in his waistcoat pocket, as he laid his hand asseveratingly upon his breast, and he became suddenly scaled up to dumbness and gloom as before. When they reached home, Anne sank upon a stool outside the door, fatigued with her excursion. Her first act was to try to pull off her shoe. It was a difficult matter— but John stood beating with his switch the leaves of the creeper on the wall. "'Mother, David, Molly, or somebody, do come and help me pull off these dirty shoes,' she cried aloud at last. "'Nobody helps me in anything.' "'I'm very sorry,' said John, coming towards her with incredible slowness and an air of unutterable depression. "'Oh, I can do without you. David is best,' she returned as the old man approached and removed the obnoxious shoes in a trice. Anne was amazed at this sudden change from devotion to crass indifference. On entering her room she flew to the glass, almost expecting to learn that some extraordinary change had come over her pretty countenance, rendering her intolerable for evermore. But it was, if anything, fresher than usual on account of the exercise. "'Well,' she said retrospectively, for the first time since their acquaintance she had this week encouraged him, and for the first time he'd shown that encouragement was useless. But perhaps he did not clearly understand, she added serenely. When he next came, it was, to her surprise, to bring her newspapers, now for some time discontinued. As soon as she saw them, she said, "'I do not care for newspapers.' The shipping news is very full and long to-day, though the print is rather small. I take no further interest in the shipping news, she replied with cold dignity. She was sitting by the window inside the table, and hence, when, in spite of her negations, he deliberately unfolded the paper and began to read about the Royal Navy, she could hardly rise and go away. With a stoical mien he read on to the end of the report bringing out the name of Bob's ship with tremendous force. "'No,' she said at last, "'I'll hear no more. Let me read to you.' The trumpet-major sat down, and turned to the military news, delivering every detail with much apparent enthusiasm. "'That's the subject I like,' she said fervently. But, but, "'But Bob is in the Navy now, and will most likely rise to be an officer, and then—' "'What is there like the army?' she interrupted. "'There's no smartness about sailors. "'They waddle like ducks, and they only fight stupid battles "'that no one can form any idea of. "'There's no science nor stratagem in sea-fights, "'nothing more than what you see when two rams "'run their heads together in a field to knock each other down. "'But in military battles there is such art and such splendour, "'and the men are so smart, particularly the horse-soldiers. 
"'How I shall never forget what gallant men you all seemed "'when you came and pitched your tents on the grounds. "'I like the cavalry better than anything I know, "'and the dragoons the best of the cavalry, "'and the trumpeters the best of the dragoons.' "'Oh, if it had but come a little sooner!' moaned John within him. He replied as soon as he could regain self-command. "'I am glad Bob is in the Navy at last. He is so much more fitted for that than the merchant service, so brave by nature, ready for any daring deed. I have heard ever so much more about his doings on board the Victory. Captain Hardy took special notice that when he—' "'I don't want to know anything more about it,' said Anne impatiently. "'Of course sailors fight. There's nothing else to do in a ship since you can't run away.' You may as well fight and be killed, as be killed not fighting. Still, it is in his character to be careless of himself when the honour of his country is concerned, John pleaded. If you'd only known him as a boy, you would own it. He would always risk his own life to save anybody else's. Once, when a cottage was afar up the lane, he rushed in for a baby, although he was only a boy himself, and he had the narrowest escape. We have got his hat now, with a hole burnt in it. Uh, shall I get it and show you? "'No, I don't wish it. There's nothing to do with me.' But as he persisted in his course towards the door, she added, "'Ah, you leave him because I am in your way. You want to be alone while you read the paper. I'll go at once. I did not see that I was interrupting you.' And she rose, as if to retreat. "'No, no, I would rather be interrupted by you than—oh, Miss Garland, excuse me. I'll just speak to Father in the Mill now I'm here.' It is scarcely necessary to state that Anne, whose unquestionable gentility and somewhat homely surroundings had been many times insisted on in the course of this history, was usually the reverse of a woman with a coming-on disposition. But whether from pique at his manner, or from wilful adherence to a course rashly resolved on, or from coquettish maliciousness in reaction from long depression, or from any other thing, so it was that she would not let him go. "'Trumpet Major,' she said, recalling him. "'Yes,' he replied timidly. "'The uh, bow of my cap ribbon has become untied, has it not?' She turned and fixed her bewitching glance upon him. The bow was just over her forehead, or more precisely, at the point where the organ of comparison merges in that of benevolence, according to the phrenological theory of Gaul. John, thus brought to, endeavoured to look at the bow in a skimming, duck-and-drake fashion, so as to avoid dipping his own glance as far as to the plane of his interrogator's eyes. "'It is untied,' he said, drawing back a little. She came nearer and asked, "'Will you tie it for me, please?' As there was no help for it, he nerved himself and assented. As her head only reached to his fourth button, she necessarily looked up for his convenience— and John began fumbling at the bow. Try as he would, it was impossible to touch the ribbon without getting his fingertips mixed with the curls of her forehead. "'Your hand shakes. Ah, you have been walking fast,' she said. "'Yes, yes.' "'Have you almost done it?' She inquiringly directed her case upward through his fingers. Uh, "'No, not, not yet.' He faltered in a warm sweat of emotion, his heart going like a flail. "'Then be quick, please.' Uh, "'Yes, I will, Miss Garland. Bob is a, is a very good fa "'Not that man's name to me,' she interrupted. John was silent instantly, and nothing was to be heard but the rustling of the ribbon, till his hands once more blundered about among the curls, and then touched her forehead. "'Oh, good God!' ejaculated the trumpet-major in a whisper, turning away hastily to the corner-cupboard and resting his face upon his hand. "'What's the matter, John?' said she. "'I can't do it.' "'What?' "'Tie your cap-ribbon.' "'Why not?' "'Because you are so—' "'Because I am clumsy and never could tie a bow.' "'You are clumsy indeed,' answered Anne, and went away. After this she felt injured, for it seemed to show that he rated her happiness as of meaner value than Bob's. Since he had persisted in his idea of giving Bob another chance when she had implied that it was her wish to do otherwise. 
Could Miss Johnson have anything to do with his firmness? An opportunity of testing him in this direction occurred some days later. She had been up in the village, and met John at the mill door. "'Have you heard the news? Matilda Johnson is going to be married to young Derriman.' Anne stood with her back to the sun, and as he faced her, his features were searchingly exhibited. There was no change whatever in them, unless it were that a certain light of interest kindled by her question turned to complete and blank indifference. "'Well, uh, as times go, it's not a bad match for her,' he said, with a phlegm which was hardly that of a lover. John, on his part, was beginning to find these temptations almost more than he could bear. But being quartered so near to his father's house, it was unnatural not to visit him, especially when at any moment the regiment might be ordered abroad, and a separation of years ensue. And as long as he went there, he could not help seeing her. The year changed from green to gold, and from gold to grey, but little change came over the house of Loveday. During the last twelve months, Bob had been occasionally heard of as upholding his country's honour in Denmark, the West Indies, Gibraltar, Malta, and other places about the globe, till the family received a short letter stating that he had arrived again at Portsmouth. At Portsmouth Bob seemed disposed to remain, for though some time elapsed without further intelligence, the gallant seaman never appeared at Overcombe. Then on a sudden John learnt that Bob's long-talked-of promotion for signal services rendered was to be an accomplished fact. The trumpet-major at once walked off to Overcombe, and reached the village in the early afternoon. Not one of the family was in the house at the moment, and John strolled onwards over the hill towards Casterbridge without much thought of direction, till, lifting his eyes, he beheld Anne Garland wandering about with a little basket upon her arm. At first John blushed with delight at the sweet vision. But, recalled by his conscience, the blush of delight was at once mangled and slain. He looked for a means of retreat. But the field was open, and a soldier was a conspicuous object. There was no escaping her. "'It was kind of you to come,' she said, with an inviting smile. "'It, it was quite by accident,' he answered, with an indifferent laugh. "'I, I thought you was at home.' Anne blushed and said nothing, and they rambled on together. In the middle of the field rose a fragment of stone wall in the form of a gable, known as Farringdon Ruin. And when they reached it, John paused, and politely asked her if she were not a little tired with walking so far. No particular reply was returned by the young lady, but they both stopped, and Anne seated herself on a stone which had fallen from the ruin to the ground. "'A church once stood here,' observed John, in a matter-of-fact tone. "'Yes, I have often shaped it out in my mind,' she returned. "'Here where I sit must have been the altar.' Mm, "'True, this standing bit of wall was the chancel end.' Anne had been adding up her little studies of the trumpet major's character, and was surprised to find how the brightness of that character increased in her eyes with each examination. A kindly and gentle sensation was again aroused in her. Here was a neglected, heroic man, who, loving her to distraction, deliberately doomed himself to pensive shade, to avoid even the appearance of standing in a brother's way. If the altar stood here, hundreds of people have been made man and wife just there, in past times, she said, with calm deliberateness, throwing a little stone on a spot about a yard westward. John annihilated another tender burst, and replied, "'Yes, uh, this field used to be a village. My grandfather could call to mind when there were houses here. But the squire pulled them down, because poor folk were an eyesore to him.' "'Do you know, John, what you once asked me to do?' she continued, not accepting the digression, and turning her eyes upon him. I "'In what sort of way?' "'In the matter of my future life, and yours.' "'I am afraid I don't. "'John Loveday!' "'He turned his back upon her for a moment, "'that she might not see his face. Uh, "'I do remember,' he said at last, "'in a dry, small, repressed voice. "'Well, need I say more? "'Isn't it sufficient?' 
"'It would be sufficient,' answered the unhappy man. "'But—' She looked up with a reproachful smile and shook her head. "'That summer,' she went on, "'you asked me ten times if you asked me once. "'I am older now, much more of a woman, you know, "'and my opinion is changed about some speak people, "'especially about one.' "'Oh, Anne, Anne!' he burst out, as, racked between honour and desire, he snatched up her hand. The next moment it fell heavily to her lap. He had absolutely relinquished it half-way to his lips. "'I have been thinking lately,' he said, with preternaturally sudden calmness, "'that men of the military profession ought not to—' "'ought to be like St. Paul, I mean.' "'Fie, John, pretending religion,' she said sternly. "'It isn't that at all. It's Bob!' "'Yes,' cried the miserable trumpet-major. "'I've had a letter from him to-day.' He pulled out a sheet of paper from his breast. "'That's it. He's promoted. He's a lieutenant and appointed to a sloop that only cruises on our own coast, so that he'll be at home on leave half his time. He'll be a gentleman some day and worthy of you.' He threw the letter into her lap, and drew back to the other side of the gable wall. Anne jumped up from her seat, flung away the letter without looking at it, and went hastily on. John did not attempt to overtake her. Picking up the letter, he followed in her wake at a distance of a hundred yards. But though Je Anne had withdrawn from his presence thus precipitately, she never thought more highly of him in her life than she did five minutes afterwards, when the excitement of the moment had passed. She saw it all quite clearly, and his self-sacrifice impressed her so much that the effect was just the reverse of what he had been aiming to produce. The more he pleaded for Bob, the more her perverse generosity pleaded for John. Today the crisis had come, with what results she had not foreseen. As soon as the trumpet major reached the nearest pen and ink, he flung himself into a seat and wrote wildly to Bob. Dear Robert, I write these few lines to let you know that if you want Anne Garland, you must come at once. You must come instantly and post haste, or she will be gone. Somebody else wants her, and she wants him. It is your last chance, in the opinion of your faithful brother and well-wisher, John. P.S. Glad to hear of your promotion. Tell me the day and I'll meet the coach. End of chapter 38 Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 39 of The Trumpet Major This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Simon Evers The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy Chapter 39. Bob Loveday Struts Up and Down One night, about a week later, two men were walking in the dark along the turnpike road towards Overcombe, one of them with a bag in his hand. Now, said the taller of the two, the squareness of whose shoulders signified that he wore epaulets, now you must do the best you can for yourself, Bob. I have done all I can, but thou hast thy work cut out, I can, I can tell thee. "'I wouldn't have run such a wish for the world,' said the other, in a tone of ingenuous contrition. "'But thou see, Jack, I didn't think there was any danger, knowing you was taking care of her and keeping my place warm for me. "'I didn't hurry myself, that's true, but thinks I, if I get this promotion, I'm promised I shall naturally have leave, and then I'll go and see em all. "'Gad, I shouldn't have been here now but for your letter.' "'You little think what risks you've run,' said his brother. "'However, try to make up for lost time.' "'All right. And whatever you do, Jack, don't say a word about this other girl. "'Hang the girl, I was a great fool, I know. "'Still, it's over now, and I'm come to my senses. "'I suppose Anne never caught a capful of wind from that quarter?' "'She knows all about it,' said John seriously. "'Knows? By George, then, I'm ruined,' said Bob, "'standing stock still in the road as if he meant to remain there all night. "'That's what I mean by saying that it would be a hard battle for you.' returned John, with the same quietness as before. Bob sighed and moved on. "'I don't deserve that woman,' he cried passionately. 
thumping his three upper ribs with his fist. "'I've thought as much myself,' observed John, with a dryness which was almost bitter. "'But it depends on how thou hast behaved in future.' "'John,' said Bob, taking his brother's hand, "'I'll be a new man. I, I solemnly swear by that eternal milestone staring at me there that I'll never look at another woman with the thought of marrying her whilst that darling is free. No, not if she be a mermaiden of light. It's a lucky thing that I'm slipped in on that quarter-deck. It may help me with her, eh? It may with her mother. I don't think it will make much difference with Anne. Still, it is a good thing, and I hope that some day you'll command a big ship. Bob shook his head. Officers are scarce, but I'm afraid my luck won't carry me so far as that. Did she ever tell you that she mentioned your name to the king? The seaman stood still again. Never, he said. How did such a thing as that happen in heaven's name? John described in detail, and they walked on, lost in conjecture. As soon as they entered the house, the returned officer of the navy was welcomed with acclamation by his father and David, with mild approval by Mrs. Loveday, and by Anne not at all that discreet maiden having carefully retired to her own room some time earlier in the evening. Bob did not dare to ask for her in any positive manner. He just inquired about her health, and that was all. "'Well, what's the matter with thy face, my son?' said the miller, staring. "'David, show a light here!' And a candle was thrust against Bob's cheek, where there appeared a jagged streak like the geological remains of a lobster. "'Oh, that's where that rascally Frenchman's grenade busted and hit me from the redoubtable, you know, as I told you in my letter.' "'Not a word.' "'What, didn't I tell ye?' "'Ah, oh, no, I, I meant to, but I, I forgot it.' "'And here's a sort of dint in your forehead, too. What does that mean, my dear boy?' said the miller, putting his finger in a chasm in Bob's skull. Uh, "'That were done in the Indies. Yeah, that was rather a troublesome chopper. Cutlass did it.' I should have told you, but I found would make my letter so long that I put it off and put it off, and at last I thought it wasn't worth while. John soon rose to take his departure. It's all up with me and her, you see, said Bob to him outside the door. She's not even going to see me. Wait a little, said the trumpet major. It was easy enough on the night of the arrival in the midst of excitement when blood was warm for Anne to be resolute in her avoidance of Bob Loveday. But in the morning, determination is apt to grow invertebrate, rules of pugnacity are less easily acted upon to, and a feeling of live and let live takes possession of the gentle soul. Anne had not meant even to sit down to the same breakfast-table with Bob. But, when the rest were assembled and had got some way through the substantial repast which was served at this hour in the miller's house, Anne entered. She came silently as a phantom, her eyes cast down, her cheeks pale. It was a good long walk from the door to the table, and Bob made a full inspection of her as she came up to a chair at the remotest corner, in the direct rays of the morning light, where she dumbly sat herself down. It was altogether different from how she had expected. Here was she, who had done nothing, feeling all the embarrassment, and Bob, who had done the wrong, feeling apparently quite at ease. "'You'll speak to Bob, won't you, honey?' said the miller, after a silence. To meet Bob like this after an absence seemed irregular in his eyes. "'If he wished me to,' she replied, so addressing the miller that no part, scrap, or outlying beam whatever of her glance passed near the subject of her remark. "'He's a lieutenant, you know, dear,' said her mother on the same side, "'and he's been dreadfully wounded.' "'Oh,' said Anne, turning a little towards the false one, at which Bob felt it to be time for him to put in a spoke for himself. "'I'm glad to see you,' he said contritely. And, "'And how do you do?' "'Very well, thank you.' He extended his hand. She allowed him to take hers, but only to the extent of a niggardly inch or so. At the same moment she glanced up at him, when their eyes met, and hers were again withdrawn. The hitch between the two younger members of the household tended to make the breakfast a dull one. Bob was so depressed by her unforgiving manner 
that he could not throw that sparkle into his stories which their substance naturally required. And when the meal was over, and they went about their different businesses, the pair resembled the two Dromios in seldom or never being, thanks to Anne's subtle contrivances, both in the same room at the same time. This kind of performance repeated itself during several days. At last, after dogging her hither and thither, leaning with a wrinkled forehead against doorposts, taking an oblique view into the room where she happened to be, picking up worsted balls and getting no thanks, placing a splinter from the victory, several bullets from the redoubtable, a strip of the flag and other interesting relics carefully labelled upon her table, and hearing no more about them than if they had been pebbles from the nearest brook, he hit upon a new plan. To avoid him, she frequently sat upstairs in a window overlooking the garden. Lieutenant Loveday carefully dressed himself in a new uniform, which he had caused to be sent some days before to dazzle admiring friends, but which he had never as yet put on in public or mentioned to a soul. When arrayed, he entered the sunny garden, and there walked slowly up and down as, as he had seen Nelson and Captain Hardy do on the quarter-deck, but keeping his right shoulder, on which his one epaulette was fixed, as much towards Anne's window as possible. But she made no sign, though there was not the least question that she saw him. At the end of half an hour he went in, took off his clothes, and gave himself up to doubt and the best tobacco. He repeated the programme on the next afternoon, and on the next, never saying a word within doors about his doings or his notice. Meanwhile, the results in Anne's chamber were not uninteresting. She had been looking out on the first day, and was duly amazed to see a naval officer in full uniform promenading in the path. Finding it to be Bob, she left the window with a sense that the scene was not for her. Then, from mere curiosity, peeping out from behind the curtain. When he was a pretty spectacle, she admitted, relieved as his figure was by a dense mass of sunny, close-trimmed hedge, over which nasturtiums climbed in wild luxuriance and if she could care for him one bit, which she couldn't, his form would have been a delightful study, surpassing in interest even its splendour on the memorable day of their visit to the town theatre. She called her mother. Mrs. Loveday came promptly. "'Oh, it is nothing,' said Anne indifferently, "'only that Bob has got his uniform.' Mrs. Loveday peeped out and raised her hands with delight. "'And he's not said a word to us about it. "'What a lovely epilot! "'I must call his father.' "'No, indeed. "'As I take no interest in him, "'I shall not let people come into my room to admire him.' "'Well, you called me,' said her mother. "'It was because I, I thought you liked fine clothes. It, "'It's what I don't care for.' "'Notwithstanding this assertion, "'she again looked out at Bob the next afternoon "'when his footsteps rustled on the gravel.' and studied his appearance under all the varying angles of the sunlight, as if fine clothes and uniforms were not altogether a matter of indifference. He certainly was a splendid, gentlemanly, and gallant saver from end to end of him. But then, what were a dashing presentiment, a naval rank, and telling scars, if a man was fickle-hearted? However, she peeped on till the fourth day, and then she did not peep. The window was open, she looked right out, and Bob knew that he had got a rise to his bait at last. He touched his hat to her, keeping his right shoulder forwards, and said, "'Good day, Miss Garland,' with a smile. Anne replied, "'Good day,' with a funereal seriousness, and the acquaintance thus revived led to the interchange of a few words at supper-time, at which Mrs. Loveday nodded with satisfaction. But Anne took especial care that he should never meet her alone, and to ensure this her ingenuity was in constant exercise. There were so many nooks and windings on the miller's rambling premises that she could never be sure he would not turn up within a foot of her, particularly as his thin shoes were almost noiseless. One fine afternoon she accompanied Molly in search of elderberries for making the family wine which was drunk by Mrs. Loveday, Anne, and anybody who could not stand the rougher and stronger liquors provided by the miller. After walking rather a long distance over the down, they came to a grassy hollow, 
were elder bushes in knots of twos and threes, rose from an uneven bank and hung their heads towards the south, black and heavy with bunches of fruit. The charm of fruit-gathering to girls is enhanced in the case of elderberries by the inoffensive softness of the leaves, boughs, and bark, which makes getting into the branches easy and pleasant to the most indifferent climbers. Anne and Molly had soon gathered a basketful, and, sending the servants home with it, Anne remained in the bush, picking and throwing down bunch by bunch upon the grass. She was so absorbed in her occupation of putting the twigs to water, and the rustling of their leaves so filled her ears, that it was a great surprise when, on turning her head, she perceived a similar movement to her own among the boughs of the adjoining bush. At first she thought they were disturbed by being partly in contact with the boughs of her bush, but in a moment Robert Loveday's face peered from them, at a distance of about a yard from her own. Anne uttered a little indignant, Well, recovered herself, and went on plucking. Bob thereupon went on plucking likewise. "'I'm picking elderberries for your mother,' said the lieutenant at last, humbly. "'So I see. And I happen to have come to the next bush to yours. "'So I see, but not the reason why.' Anne was now in the westernmost branches of the bush, and Bob had leant across into the eastern branches of his. In gathering, he swayed towards her, back again, forward again. "'I beg pardon.' he said, when a further swing than usual had taken him almost in contact with her. "'Then why do you do it?' "'The, the wind rocks the bow, and the bow rocks me.' She expressed by her look her, her opinion of this statement in the face of the gentlest breeze, and Bob pursued, "'I'm afraid the berries will stain your pretty hands.' "'I wear gloves.' Uh, "'That's a plan I should never have thought of. Uh, can I help you?' "'Not at all.' "'You are offended, that's what that means.' "'No,' she said. "'Then will you shake hands?' Anne hesitated, then slowly stretched out her hand, which he took at once. "'That will do,' she said, finding that he did not relinquish it immediately. But as he still held it, she pulled, the effect of which was to draw Bob's swaying person, bow and all, towards her, and herself towards him. "'I am afraid to let go your hand.' said that officer, for if I do your spar will fly back and you will be thrown upon the deck with great violence. I wish you to let me go. He accordingly did, and she flew back, but did not by any means fall. It reminds me of the times when I used to be aloft clinging to a yard not much bigger than this tree stem in the mid-Atlantic, and thinking about you. I could see you in my fancy as plain as I see you now. "'Me or some other woman?' retorted Anne haughtily. "'No,' declared Bob, shaking the bush for emphasis. "'I'll protest that I don't think of anybody but you all the time we were dropping down Channel, all the time we were off Cadiz, all the way through battles and bombardments. I seem to see you in the smoke, and thinks I, if I go to Davy's locker, what would she do?' "'You didn't think that when you landed after Trafalgar?' "'Well, now,' said the lieutenant in a reasoning tone. That was a curious thing. You'll hardly believe it, maybe, but when a man is away from the woman he loves best in the port world, I mean, he can have a sort of temporary feeling for another without disturbing the old one, which flows along under the same as ever. I can't believe it, and I won't, said Anne firmly. Molly now appeared with the empty basket, and when it had been filled from the heap on the grass, Anne went home with her, bidding Loveday a frigid adieu. The same evening, when Bob was absent, the miller proposed that they should all three go to an upper window of the house to get a distant view of some rockets and illuminations which were to be exhibited in the town and harbour in honour of the king, who had returned this year as usual. They accordingly went upstairs to an empty attic, placed chairs against the window, and put out the light, Anne sitting in the middle, her mother close by, and the miller behind, smoking. No sign of any pyrotechnic display was visible over the port as yet, and Mrs. Loveday passed the time by talking to the miller, who replied in monosyllables. While this was going on, Anne fancied that she heard someone approach. 
and presently felt sure that Bob was drawing near her in the surrounding darkness. But as the other two had noticed nothing, she said not a word. All at once the swarthy expanse of southward sky was broken by the blaze of several rockets simultaneously ascending from different ships in the roads. At the very same moment a warm, mysterious hand slipped round her own, and gave it a gentle squeeze. "'Oh, dear!' said Anne, with a sudden start away. "'How nervous you are, child, to be startled by fireworks so far off!' said Mrs. Loveday. "'I never saw rockets before,' murmured Anne, recovering from her surprise. Mrs. Loveday presently spoke again. "'I wonder what's become of Bob!' Anne did not reply, being much exercised in trying to get her hand away from the one that imprisoned it, and whatever the miller thought, he kept to himself, because it disturbed his smoking to speak. Another batch of rockets went up. "'Oh, I never,' said Anne, in a half-suppressed tone, springing in her chair. A second hand had, with the rise of the rockets, leapt round her waist. "'Poor girl, you certainly must have change of scene at this rate.' said Mrs. Loveday. Uh, I, "'I suppose I must,' murmured the dutiful daughter. For some minutes nothing further occurred to disturb Anne's serenity. Then a slow, quiet <coughs> came from the obscurity of the apartment. "'What, Barb, how long have you been there?' inquired Mrs. Loveday. "'Not long,' said the lieutenant coolly. "'I heard you were all here, and crept up quietly not to disturb ye. "'Why don't you wear heels to your shoes like Christian people, "'and not creep about so like a cat?' "'Well, it keeps your floors clean to go slipshod.' Mm, "'That's true.' "'Meanwhile Anne was gently but firmly "'trying to pull Bob's arm from her waist, "'her distressful difficulty being that in freeing her waist "'she enslaved her hand,' and in getting her hand free she enslaved her waist. Finding the struggle a futile one, owing to the invisibility of her antagonist, and her wish to keep its nature secret from the other two, she rose, and saying that she did not care to see any more, felt her way downstairs. Bob followed, leaving Loveday and his wife to themselves. "'Dear Anne,' he began, when he got down and saw her in the candlelight of the large room, but she adroitly passed out at the other door, at which he took a candle and followed her to the small room. "'Dear Anne, do let me speak,' he repeated, as soon as the rays revealed her figure. But she passed into the bakehouse before he could say more, whereupon he perseveringly did the same. Looking round for her here, he perceived her at the end of the room, where there was no means of exit whatever. "'Dear Anne,' he began again, setting down the candle, "'You must try to forgive me. Really, you must. I, I love you the best of anybody in the wide, wide world. Try to forgive me. Come!' And he imploringly took her hand. Anne's bosom began to surge and fall like a small tide, her eyes remaining fixed upon the floor, till, when Loveday ventured to draw her slightly towards him, she burst out, crying. "'I don't like you, Bob. I don't!' she suddenly exclaimed between her sobs. "'I did once, but I, I don't know. I can't. I can't. You've been very cruel to me.' She violently turned away, weeping. I, "'I I've been terribly bad, I know,' answered Bob, conscience-stricken by her grief. "'But if you could only forgive me, I promise that I'll never do anything to grieve ye again. Do you forgive me, Anne?' Anne's only reply was crying and shaking her head. "'Let's make it up. Come, say we've made it up, dear.' She withdrew her hand, and, still keeping her eyes buried in her handkerchief, said, "'No.' "'Very well, then,' exclaimed Bob, with sudden determination. "'Now I know my doom. And whatever you hear of as happening to me, mind this, you cruel girl, that it is all your causing.' Saying this, he strode with a hasty tread across the room into the passage and out at the door, slamming it loudly behind him. Anne suddenly looked up from her handkerchief, and stared with round, wet eyes and parted lips at the door by which she had gone. Having remained with suspended breath in this attitude for a few seconds, she turned round, bent her head upon the table, 
and burst out weeping anew with thrice the violence of the former time. It really seemed now as if her grief would overwhelm her. All the emotions which had been suppressed, bottled up and concealed since Bob's return, having made themselves a sluice at last. But such things have their end, and left to herself in the large, vacant, old apartment, she grew quieter, and at last calm. At length she took the handle and ascended to her bedroom, where she bathed her eyes and looked in the glass to see if she had made herself a dreadful object. It was not so bad as she had expected, and she went downstairs again. Nobody was there, and sitting down she wondered what Bob had really meant by his words. It was too dreadful to think that he intended to go straight away to sea without seeing her again, and frightened at what she had done, she waited anxiously for his return. End of chapter 39 Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 40 of The Trumpet Major This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Simon Evers The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy Chapter 40. A Call on Business Her suspense was interrupted by a very gentle tapping at the door, and then the rustle of a hand over its surface, as if searching for the latch in the dark. The door opened a few inches, and the alabaster face of Uncle Benji appeared in the slit. "'Oh, Squire Derriman, you frighten me!' "'All alone?' he asked him in a whisper. "'My mother and Mr. Loveday are somewhere about the house.' "'That'll do,' he said, coming forward. "'I be worried out of my life, and I have thought of you again. "'You yourself, dear Anne, and not the miller. "'If you will only take this and lock it up for a few days "'till I can find another good place for it. "'If you only would!' "'And he breathlessly deposited the tin box on the table. "'What? Obliged to dig it up from the cellar?' "'Aye, my nephew hath a scent of the place.' How, I don't know, but he and a young woman he's met with are a-searching everywhere. I worked like a wire-drawer to get it up and away while they were scraping in the next cellar. Now where could ye put it, dear? Tis only a few documents, and my will, and such like, you know. Poor soul of me, I'm worn out with running and fright. I'll put it here till I can think of a better place, said Anne, lifting the box. Dear me, how heavy it is! Yes, yes, said Uncle Benji hastily. The box is iron, you see. However, take care of it, because I'm going to make it worth your while. Ah, you're a good girl, Anne. I wish she was mine. Anne looked at Uncle Benji. She had known for some time that she possessed all the affection he had to bestow. Why do you wish that? she said simply. Now don't ye argue with me. Where do ye put the coffer? Here, said Anne, going to the window seat, which rose as a flap, disclosing a boxed receptacle beneath as in many old houses. "'Tis very well for the present,' he said dubiously, and they dropped the coffer in, and locking down the seat and giving him the key. "'Now I don't want ye to be on my side for nothing,' he went on. "'I never did now, did I? This is for you.' He handed her a little packet of paper, which Anne turned over and looked at curiously. "'I always meant to do it,' continued Uncle Benji, gazing at the packet as it lay in her hand, and sighing. "'Come, open it, my dear. I always meant to do it.' She opened it, and found twenty new guineas snugly packed within. "'Yes, they are for you. I always meant to do it,' he said, sighing again. "'But you owe me nothing,' returned Anne, holding them out. "'Don't say it,' cried Uncle Benji, covering his eyes. "'Put them away. Well, if you don't want them, but put them away, dear Anne. They're for you, because you've kept my counsel.' Good night to ye. Yes, they are for you. He went a few steps, and turning back, added anxiously, You won't spend them in clothes, or waste them in fairings, or ornaments of any kind, my dear girl? I will not, said Anne. I wish you would have them. No, no, said Uncle Benji, rushing off to escape their shine. But he got no further than the passage when he returned again. And you won't lend them to anybody, or put them into the bank? for no bank is safe in these troublous times. If I was used, I'd keep them exactly as they be, 
and not spend em on any account. Shall I lock em into my box for ye? Certainly, said she, and the farmer rapidly unlocked the window bench, opened the box, and locked them in. Ah, it is much the best plan, he said with great satisfaction as he returned the keys to his pocket. There they will always be safe, you see, and you won't be exposed to temptation. When the old man had been gone a few minutes, the miller and his wife came in, quite unconscious of all that had passed. Anne's anxiety about Bob was again uppermost now, and she spoke but meagerly of old Derriman's visit, and nothing of what he had left. She would fain have asked them if they knew where Bob was, but that she did not wish to inform them of the rupture. She was forced to admit to herself that she had somewhat tried his patience, and that impulsive men had been known to do dark things with themselves at such times. They sat down to supper. The clock ticked rapidly on, and at length the miller said, "'Bob's later than usual. Where can he be?' As they both looked at her, she could no longer keep the secret. "'It is my fault,' she cried. "'I have driven him away. What shall I do?' The nature of the quarrel was at once guessed, and her two elders said no more. Anne rose and went to the front door, where she listened for every sound with a palpitating heart. Then she went in, then she went out, and on one occasion she heard the miller say, "'I wonder what has passed between Bob and Anne. I hope the chap will come home.' Just about this time light footsteps were heard without, and Bob bounced into the passage. Anne, who stood back in the dark while he passed, followed him into the room where her mother and the miller were on the point of retiring to bed, candle in hand. "'I've kept you up, I fear,' began Bob cheerily, and apparently without the faintest recollection of his tragic exit from the house. "'But the truth on it is, I met with Fest Derriman at the Duke of York as I went from here, and there we have been playing put ever since, not noticing how the time was going. I haven't had a good chat with the fellow for years and years.' Really, he is an out-and-out good comrade, a regular hearty. Poor fellow, he's been very badly used. I never heard the rights of the story till now, but it seems that old uncle of his treats him shamefully. He's been hiding away his money, so that poor Fess might not have a farthing, till at last the young man has turned like any other worm, and is now determined to ferret out what he has done with it. The poor young chap hadn't a farthing of ready money till I lent him a couple of guineas. I think I never did more willingly in my life. "'But the man was very honourable. "'No, no,' says he, "'don't let me deprive ye. "'He's going to marry. "'And what may you think he's going to do it for?' "'For love, I hope,' said man's mother. <laughs> "'For money, I suppose, since he's so short,' said the miller. "'No,' said Bob, "'for spite. "'He's been badly served, deuce badly served, by a woman. "'I never heard of a more heartless case in my life. "'The poor chap won't mention names.' But it seems this young woman has trifled with him in all manner of cruel ways, pushed him into the river, tried to steal his horse when he was called out to defend his country, in short, served him rascally. So I gave him the two guineas, and said, Now let's drink to the Uzzy's downfall. Oh, said Anne, having approached behind him. Bob turned and saw her, and at the same moment Mr. and Mrs. Loveday discreetly retired by the other door. "'Is it peace?' he asked tenderly. "'Oh, yes,' she anxiously replied. "'I didn't mean to make you think I had no heart.' At this, Bob inclined his countenance towards hers. "'No,' she said, smiling through two incipient tears as she drew back. "'You are to show good behaviour for six months, "'and you must promise not to frighten me again by running off when I "'show you how badly you have served me.' "'I am yours obedient in anything,' cried Bob. "'But am I pardoned?' Youth is foolish, and does a woman often let her reasoning in favour of the worthier stand in the way of her perverse desire for the less worthy at such times as these? She murmured some soft words, ending with, "'Do you repent?' It would be superfluous to transcribe Bob's answer. Footsteps were heard without. "'Oh, be glad I forgot,' said Bob. "'He's waiting out there for a light.' "'Who?' "'My friend Derriman.' "'But, Bob, I have to explain.' But Festus had by this time entered the lobby, and Anne, with a hasty, "'Get rid of him at once,' vanished upstairs. 
Here she waited, and waited. But Festus did not seem inclined to depart, and at last, foreboding some collision of interests from Bob's new friendship for this man, she crept into a storeroom which was over the apartment into which Loveday and Festus had gone. By looking through a knot-hole in the floor, it was easy to command a view of the room beneath, this being unsealed, with moulded beams and rafters. Festus had sat down on the hollow window-bench, and was continuing the statement of his wrongs. If he only knew what he was sitting upon, she thought apprehensively, how easily he could tear up the flap, lock and all, with his strong arm, and seize upon poor old Uncle Benji's possessions. But he did not appear to know, unless he were acting, which was just possible. After a while he rose, and going to the table, lifted the candle to light his pipe. At the moment when the flame began diving into the bowl, the door noiselessly opened and a figure slipped across the room to the window-bench, hastily unlocked it, withdrew the box, and beat a retreat. Anne, in a moment, recognised the ghostly intruder as Festus Derriman's uncle. Before he could get out of the room, Festus set down the candle and turned. "'What, Uncle Benji? Ha, ha! Here at this time of night?' Uncle Benji's eyes grew paralysed, and his mouth opened and shut like a frog's in a drought, the action producing no sound. "'What have we got here? A tin box? The box of boxes! Why, I'll carry it for you, Uncle. I'm going home. Uh, no, 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 thank ye, Festus. It, it, it's not heavy at all, thank ye,' gasped the squireen. "'Oh, but I must!' said Festus, pulling at the box. "'Don't let him have it, Bob!' screamed the excited Anne through the hole in the floor. "'No, don't let him!' cried the uncle. "'Tis a plot! There's a woman at the window waiting to help him!' Anne's eyes flew to the window, and she saw Matilda's face pressed against the pane. Bob, though he did not know whence Anne's command proceeded, obeyed with alacrity, pulled the box from the two relatives, and placed it on the table beside him. "'Now look here, Artis, what's the meaning of this?' he said. "'He's trying to rob me of all I possess!' cried the old man. "'My heart-strings seem as if they were going crack, crack, crack!' At this instant the miller in his shirt-sleeves entered the room, having got thus far in his undressing when he heard the noise. Bob and Festus turned to him to explain, and when the latter had had his say, Bob added, "'Well, all I know is that this box—' Here he stretched out his hand to lay it upon the lid for emphasis— but as nothing but thin air met his fingers where the box had been, he turned and found that the box was gone, Uncle Benji having vanished also. Festus, with an imprecation, hastened to the door, but though the night was not dark, Farmer Derriman and his burden were nowhere to be seen. On the bridge, Festus joined a shadowy female form, and they went along the road together, followed for some distance by Bob, lest they should meet with and harm the old man. But the precaution was unnecessary. Nowhere on the road was there any sign of Farmer Derriman, or of the box that belonged to him. When Bob re-entered the house, Anne and Mrs. Loveday had joined the miller downstairs, and then, for the first time, he learnt who had been the heroine of Festus's lamentable story, with many other particulars of that yeoman's history which he had never before known. Bob swore that he would not speak to the traitor again, and the family retired. The escape of old Mr. Derriman from the annoyances of his nephew not only held good for that night, but for next day and for ever. Just after dawn on the following morning, a labouring man, who had gone to his work, saw the old farmer and landowner leaning over a rail in a mead near his house, apparently engaged in contemplating the water of a brook before him. Drawing near, the man spoke, but Uncle Benji did not reply. His head was hanging strangely his body being supported in its erect position entirely by the rail that passed under each arm. On after examination, it was found that Uncle Benji's poor withered heart had cracked and stopped its beating from damages inflicted on it by the excitements of his life, and of the previous night in particular. The unconscious carcass was little more than a light, empty husk, dry and fleshless as that of a dead heron found on a moor in January. But the tin box was not discovered with or near him. It was searched for all the week and all the month. The mill pond was dragged, quarries were examined, woods were threaded, rewards were offered, but in vain. 
At length, one day, in the spring, when the mill-house was about to be cleaned throughout, the chimney-board of Anne's bedroom, concealing a yawning fireplace, had to be taken down. In the chasm behind stood the missing deed-box of Farmer Derriman. Many were the conjectures as to how it had got there. Then Anne remembered that on going to bed on the night of the collision between Festus and his uncle in the room below, she had seen mud on the carpet of her room, and the miller remembered that he had seen footprints on the back staircase. The solution of the mystery seemed to be that the late Uncle Benji, instead of running off from the house with his box, had doubled on getting out of the front door, entered at the back, deposited his box in Anne's chamber, where it was found, and then leisurely pursued his way home at the heels of Festus, intending to tell Anne of his trick the next day, an intention that was for ever frustrated by the stroke of death. Mr. Derriman's solicitor was a Casterbridge man, and Anne placed the box in his hands. Uncle Benji's will was discovered within, and by this testament Anne's queer old friend appointed her sole executrix of his said will, and more than that, gave and bequeathed to the same young lady all his real and personal estate, with the solitary exception of five small freehold houses in a back street in Budmouth, which were devised to his nephew, Festus, as a sufficient property to maintain him decently, without affording any margin for extravagances. Oxwell Hall, with its muddy quadrangle, archways, mullioned windows, cracked battlements, and weed-grown garden, passed with the rest into the hands of Anne. End of chapter 40 Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 41 of The Trumpet Major This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy Chapter 41 John Marches into the Night During this exciting time, John Loveday seldom or never appeared at the mill. With the recall of Bob, in which he had been sole agent, his mission seemed to be complete. One midday before Anne had made any change in her manner of living, on account of her unexpected acquisition, Lieutenant Bob came in rather suddenly. He had been to Budmouth, and announced to the arrested senses of the family that the Nth Dragoons were ordered to join Sir Arthur Wellesley in the peninsula. These tidings produced a great impression on the household. John had been so long in the neighborhood, either at camp or I barracks, that they had almost forgotten the possibility of his being sent away, and they now began to reflect upon the singular infrequency of his calls since his brother's return. There was not much time, however, for reflection, if they wished to make the most of John's farewell visit, which was to be paid the same evening, the departure of the regiment being fixed for next day. A hurried valedictory supper was prepared during the afternoon, and shortly afterwards John arrived. He seemed to be more thoughtful and a trifle paler than of old, but beyond these traces which might have been due to the natural wear and tear of time, he showed no signs of gloom. On his way through the town that morning, a curious little incident had occurred to him. He was walking past one of the churches when a wedding party came forth, the bride and bridegroom being Matilda and Festus Derriman. At sight of the trumpet major, the yeoman had glared triumphantly. Matilda, on her part, had winked at him slyly, as much as to say. But what she meant, heavens knows, the trumpet major did not trouble himself to think, and passed on without returning the mark of confidence with which she had favored him. Soon after John's arrival at the mill, several of his friends dropped in for the same purpose of bidding adieu. 
they were mostly the men who had been entertained there on the occasion of the regiment's advent on the down when anne and her mother were coaxed in to grace the party by their superior presence and their well-trained gallant manners were such as to make them interesting visitors now as at all times for it was a period when romance had not so greatly faded out of military life as it has done in these days of short service heterogeneous mixing and transient campaigns when the esprit de corps was strong and long experience stamped noteworthy professional characteristics even on rank and file while the miller's visitors had the additional advantage of being picked men they could not stay so long to-night as on that earlier and more cheerful occasion and the final adieus were spoken at an early hour it was no mere playing at departure as when they had gone to exonbury barracks and there was a warm and prolonged shaking of hands all round you'll wish the poor fellows good-bye said bob to anne who had not come forward for that purpose like the rest they are going away and would like to have your good word she then shyly advanced and every man felt that he must make some pretty speech as he shook her by the hand good-bye may you remember us as long as it makes ye happy and forget us as soon as it makes ye sad said sergeant brett good-night health wealth and long life to ye said sergeant major wills taking her hand from brett i trust to meet ye again as the wife of a worthy man said trumpeter buck we'll drink your health throughout the campaign and so good-bye to ye said saddler sergeant jones raising her hand to his lips three others followed with similar remarks to each of which anne blushingly replied as well as she could wishing them a prosperous voyage easy conquest and a speedy return but alas for that battles and skirmishes advances and retreats fevers and fatigues told hard on anne's gallant friends in the coming time of the seven upon whom these wishes were bestowed five including the trumpet major were dead men within the few following years and their bones left to moulder in the land of their campaigns john lingered behind when the others were outside expressing a final farewell to his father bob and mrs loveday he came to anne who remained within but i thought you were going to look in again before leaving she said gently no i i find i cannot good-bye john said anne holding his right hand in both hers i must tell you something you were wise in not taking me at my word that day i was greatly mistaken about myself gratitude is not love though i wanted to make it so for the time you don't call me thoughtless for what i did my dear anne cried john with more gaiety than truthfulness don't let yourself be troubled what happens is for the best soldiers love here to-day and there to-morrow who knows that you won't hear of my attentions to some spanish maid before a month has gone by tis the way of us you know a soldier's heart is not worth a week's purchase ha ha good-bye good-bye Anne felt the expediency of his manner, received the affection as real, and smiled her reply, not knowing that the adieu was for evermore. Then, with a tear in his eye, he went out of the door, where he bade farewell to the miller, Mrs. Loveday, and Bob, who said at parting, "'It's all right, Jack, my dear fellow. After a coaxing that would have been enough to win three ordinary English women, five French, and ten mulatters, she has to-day agreed to bestow her hand upon me at the end of six months. Good-bye, Jack. Good-bye.' The candle held by his father shed its waving light upon John's face and uniform, as with a farewell smile he turned on the doorstone, backed by the black night. 
and in another moment he had plunged into the darkness, the ring of his smart step dying away upon the bridge as he joined his companions in arms, and went off to blow his trumpet, till silenced forever upon one of the bloody battlefields of Spain. End of chapter 41 Recording by Aaron Elliott, St. Louis, Missouri End of The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy